Hello and welcome to this Simply Joyful podcast live. I'm so happy to have you here listening in. And for those of you listening live, you have the opportunity to ask questions. Today on the show, I'm going to be bringing on Sarita Holzman. She is the co-founder of Sunlight. And if you are a homeschool family, you know exactly what I'm talking about. Now, for those of you who are unfamiliar with Sunlight, you are in for a treat. Sunlight is a literature-based homeschool curriculum, but they're also one of the best resources if you are looking for books for your summer reading. And that's actually exactly what we're going to be talking about today. We've been talking about summer reading. So um, first, before I bring on Sarita, we are going to have a little chat because I want to make sure that we're connecting here online at Facebook. So make sure that you are clicking over and hitting like and follow here on Facebook so you don't miss other opportunities like this to hear from wonderful guests. Also, I'm hoping that we are connecting online in other areas. If you go to christyclover.com slash join, and I will put that up in the show notes, you can get a free copy. I'll show you if I can grab my book. <laughs> right here, get a free digital copy of my book, Sanity Savers for Moms. And homeschool families, you know the podcast is not always about homeschooling, but today we're breaking that rule a little. And so we're going to be talking about homeschooling. So since we are, I have a special coupon for you guys. Um, right now, my homeschool organization course, this is the DV DVD version. I actually recommend the digital online version because it's more organized. Go figure. I like organization, but I have a special coupon code for you. If you do Clover 10, you can get $10 off of my course, either the DVD or the digital course. And you can find that at homeschoolorganization.com. Also, don't forget that I have other resources too, like Homeschool Basics. So if you are a family considering homeschooling, check out Homeschool Basics. It's a book that I co-wrote with none other than Trisha Goyer. So I hope that you will check that out. But without further ado, let me bring Sarita on to the show so we can start our conversation. So hello, Sarita, and welcome to the Simply Joyful podcast. Hi, welcome. I'm glad to be here. Thank you for inviting me. Absolutely. So let's start off by chatting a little bit. Oops, I've got your, um, we've got a little glitch here. I'm going to fix your uh, your name with sunlight on it. Got Facebook really upset. So <laughs> there, it's happy. It was like doing a little quick, you know, pulsing and like really Facebook was excited to have you on. That's all I can say. <laughs> <laughs> but why don't we start off by you sharing a little bit about yourself and your family and what it is you do. Okay, I'd be glad to. Um, I'm a mom and a wife. I have four wonderful grown children and I have nine living grandchildren uh, who are all actually being homeschooled, which is super fun. And they're all being homeschooled with Sunlight. Um, okay. I know, super fun. <laughs> My husband and I started Sunlight almost 30 years ago. It was uh, in to meet a need for home, uh, missionary families. <laughs> we lived at the US Center for World Mission and we were at a community where everybody had to homeschool. So we all had the same dilemma. What do we do with our kids? And my backyard neighbor said to me, why don't we start you know, a, a company where we supply people, we send people what they need, what they need overseas. I thought, well, I'm an organized person. I can do that in the afternoon while my kids nap. Okay. <laughs> and I was going at the beginning of sunlight. I pulled together the best resources I had and I bought them from the vet vendors and shipped them out of a little garage. And that's really where some started. Isn't that a great story? <laughs> that's amazing. I did not know the backstory. Oh. Now, what, I mean, so again, you guys are very literature based and mm. I love that, but that means you've had a lot of books through the years that you've been looking through. So mm. out of curiosity about how many books would you say you've reviewed in order to, to get sunlight where it is today? Well, I've always been a reader, even from when I was younger. I would, uh, I had a bike, and we had a local library, and I would take a bike with saddlebags, and I would get as many books as the library would let me check out, which at that point, time it was 50. But I was, I've always been a voracious reader. So when I started Sunlight, I kind of drew on that pool of books. And I've always been, a, I always love to read. So in fact, I'd rather read than eat. So, and I love to eat. So it's one of those where <laughs> I was like, okay, let's, uh, <laughs> let me do that. So, um, I can't even imagine how many books I've read. If I read about well, more than 300 a year, and I'm, I won't tell you how old I am, but I'm old. <laughs> I've been reading a lot. <laughs> You've been 29 a few times. <laughs> no, I'll that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> wow. So I, and, go ahead. 
Oh no, I was like, that's so cool. My son was so excited because he read, I think he hit a hundred books last year and he was like, yes. So I'm gonna have to tell him like, she's got gotcha. you. <laughs> <laughs> no, you say good, good job, you rock. Oh yeah, oh yeah. Well, he was reading like, one of them was like Mark Twain's autobiography. Oh, it was okay. like this big. He took the cutest picture. I, I need to find it again. Mm -hmm. And he just was being silly and he's just like this book if you fell asleep reading it i think it could kill you so he took this picture of himself like draped over the couch with the book on his head and he wrote his obituary like you know <laughs> death by mark twain type of thing so I love i've never met him <laughs> i know <laughs> you would love him he's <laughs> okay by my book Right? I know. He actually is a voracious reader, which is why it's so fun to talk to someone who loves books. And so uh, most families, regardless if they're homeschool families or not homeschool families, families, children, we try to keep them reading during the summer. Some of us, like like me, I sometimes have, oh, we'll do all of these things in the summer. It'll be great. We'll keep up on that. Then we'll we'll do this fun little, you know, whatever thing during the summer. But reading is probably the one thing that we can actually pull off. So I'd love to hear from you about, you know, because you've probably done a lot more research than I have about the importance of actually having kids read during the summer. It's actually super important. And I'd probably set aside everything else that you're planning on doing and just have your kids read. Wow. And be a huge amount because there's all kinds of studies show that show that kids lose the ability to read because it's such a different skill set than anything. Yeah. Like when we just talk, that's easy. But when you read, you have to do so many different skills that are incorporated into that. And we lose some of that if we don't read. But they, mm -hmm. they only have to do about six, six books over a summer. So hopefully as moms, we can figure that out and help our kids find books to read. Go, And that's my goal today. Encourage you to give your kids books to read. And I have some strategies on how to do that, uh, yeah. how, to, how to get them going. Uh, it's partially, there's a lot of them, there's there's several of them. But the main thing is you wanna just make sure you keep on reading. Every day, make sure you assign it maybe. So just maybe give your kids, I don't know, maybe a time after breakfast or after lunch, we're gonna just stop and read for a little while. Schools do it and they found it to be effective. We can certainly learn from them if we need to. But just set a time every day when you're actually gonna say, let's just sit down and read. And it's mm -hmm. good. For kids who are struggling with reading, it sometimes helps to have them read aloud to their pets. Uh, they found that kids, yeah, that kids, uh, of course, pets love to hear their, their owner's voice. So they are more than willing recipients of whatever their kids might read to them, but it can help a timid reader to kind of come outside of themselves. So it could be something to do. Um, my, guinea, my granddaughter has guinea pigs and uh, she holds them and they read and that works out really, really well. It helps them get over some of their nervousness. Isn't a good idea? <laughs> <laughs> oh. I, I would like to recommend that students always read below their ability level. It's super oh, important yeah. mm -hmm, because it's one of those that uh, what studies have found is because reading can be so challenging and think about it, even for us, if we're reading something like a um, science textbook or something and we don't know half of the terminology in there, think how challenging that is for us as well. Mm -hmm. You know, if we were reading a rocket science journal or whatever, you might not even understand what you're reading. That's yeah. <laughs> our kids, right? So we need to make sure we're having them read at a level that they enjoy the reading. They want to make sure you want to make sure they have enough of the vocabulary that they can just read it without trouble. So that's super important. Mm -hmm. Just make sure you try to do that. And if your kids want to read picture books, please, please, please let them. I mean, yeah. there's great vocabulary in picture books. And if that's a tool to help them, just please, please let them do that. Uh, one of the other things you can do is listen to audiobooks. That seems to be something as effective. Um, <laughs> I know when my kids were young, this is a long time ago, but we used to take uh, books on cassettes when we traveled. <laughs> and honestly, that is the greatest tip I've ever found for travel because the only thing you hear from your kids is, oh, can you pass me that one when you're done? Or, or maybe I could use that one next. Otherwise, they're just silent because they're listening to great stories in the background. Right. Great tip, so please do it. <laughs> maybe join a summer reading program. Uh, most libraries have them, and if you or set up your own. It's one of those where you can say, you know, you read this many books, and I'll give you whatever it might be. A trip to a nice one store or something they've bonded for a while. Yes. Loud is so important that set aside the money, just make sure it happens, just to have it done. And then model reading. That's probably the biggest one. As moms, we want to make sure we're always reading so our kids know that this is something we value, something we think is important, and something we think is good. 
I mean, we can, we're always setting examples for kids anyway, right? So that would be something to try and do. I love it. No, modeling is so important to model mm -hmm. that, that good habit of reading. And uh, we have really fun programs out here. Our library sometimes teams up with mm -hmm. In-N-Out Burger. Oh. And so you can get burgers and sometimes it's ice cream coupons and stuff. But our we have the San Diego uh, County Fair that comes into town. And so they always have like discounted or even sometimes free tickets. Um, that, so if you are in San Diego, that's mm -hmm. how you get some, <laughs> get some good little bonuses is to, uh, I mean, and save money because you can go to the fair and have fun as a family and not have to pay the price for your kids to get in. And I think it's, sometimes it's just like five books. That I, mm -hmm. I always wonder like, what if they're five, like little tiny little books, but like the little kids, they don't care. They'll, mm -hmm. they'll do those. Mm -hmm. um, but I love that suggestion of keeping it just under, keep it easy for them. So mm -hmm. that's fabulous. Mm -hmm. I love it. And oh, and Stephanie is actually on live right now, putting some great um, connections down there. Some some blog posts. Um, in what am I trying to say? <laughs> so, I'm like <laughs> links. Um, yes, links. <laughs> links to articles. I'm like it's there. It's there. This is live, folks. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. Well, through the years, you've obviously had the opportunity to look at a lot of different books. And I know that I always using sunlight. If I am doing anything in my homeschool, I, I think I don't think I've had a, a single year in our homeschool where I have not at some point been like, now, what are some other books that I can incorporate mm -hmm. in? And so you guys have like probably the best resource for trying to find, you know, just new, another reader for a, a child or if we're doing a, something in a history based anything, you know, like just looking for those other little books or character or Bible. Mm -hmm. There's so many amazing resources, but I'm sure you have developed a few of your favorites. So do you have any kind of top top books that you really love for families to go through that you suggested for people? I'd be glad to uh, share. I did do some thinking about this because I thought uh, yeah. I went back through our sunlight catalog because I thought, oh, can I even think of ones that I could potentially use? <laughs> so that it is a good resource. Actually, if you need more, please, please, please order our catalog. We'd be more than glad to send it to you. And it's loaded with great books. But what I thought we would do is um, one of them would be two that we've added since I homeschooled my kids. One of them is Captain Nobody, which is the story of a young boy who thinks he's very unexciting and very uninteresting, but he ends up uh, just being amazing, super fun read. And I think it'd be some that your young boys even would like. Another one that our Sunlight families adore is called Adventures with Waffles. And it's a story of a little community in, I believe it's in Norway, and it's charming and beautiful. And uh, our customers rave about it every year. It would be one that you really enjoy. Yeah. Another one that I would recommend would be um, the Little Britches series. Uh, we carry it in some of our different curriculums, but there was one year when my husband and our youngest son, when he was 17, chose to read through the whole series over the course of the summer. Uh, so they sat shoulder to shoulder on the couch and uh, just went through the story of a young boy who was raised in Colorado, which is really, really right near where I live, and the struggles and the hardships, it's, and it's beautifully, beautifully written. In fact, World Magazine uh, did a contest on the very best last lines of a story, and I'm believing that Little Bridges won that award. <laughs> I mean, it's just, if you haven't read it, uh, read it for the last line. <laughs> Everyone's flipping to the end of the book. Please, 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 yeah. what you're supposed to do. Stop, stop. <laughs> this is the boy first. That's right. Another one that um, we read as a family was uh, The Wolves of Willoughby Chase, which is kind of an adventure drama story. And I was reading it to my children aloud. And my husband at the time was working in a home office. And he came running out and said, what are you reading? That's so exciting. Anyway, it's one of those to possibly try. And then the last one um, is a total family favorite. It's called A Murder for Her Majesty. I uh, said in Elizabethan Egypt and it's little choir boys and oh my goodness, you just can't imagine how fun it is, but a mystery and very, very fun. So those would be ones that I would recommend. As oh well, as, yeah, let me give, give a plug as well. Oh, we no. Do you know one. Of summer readers every year. Uh, every year I, um, I read over 300 books a year and I look for things that I think might not fit in the curriculum, but would be really entertaining for kids to read. So we pull together packages of for elementary boys and girls. And anyway, so go to our website and check those out. Those are a great resource as well. That's fabulous. In fact, we'll give a little disclaimer here for not disclaimer, but a little like inside scoop. We're doing a giveaway with you guys. And we're going to give away a series. So the summer readers. So 
so excited. <laughs> so those of you who are listening here get to find out more about that very soon. So stay tuned. <laughs> we'll share more. But I think that's such a fun idea because, yeah, I don't think about having to make the books actually fit within your curriculum. <laughs> Just add a year of like, this is the random year of like <laughs> <laughs> there, is, there is one year that we actually kind of do that with. Uh, we do one year we do the history of science. And I thought, well, you could do, you know, books that fit kind of with what the scientists are studying. And I thought, no, no, let's just do a year of great books. So that's Jay for one year. So I we love actually it. took your idea. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> oh, well, as you mentioned, you go through about three, 300 books a year. That is amazing. Amazing. It's probably, it's probably more than that if you count how many I evaluate as well, because there's there's wow. some that we just don't want to use, right? It's, it's a <laughs> right. Lot of, Thank you for that. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> that's one of the questions I get all the time mm -hmm. for uh, and that was one of the things that when I first started homeschooling, I'm like, I can't keep up. I can't be mm -hmm. teaching all of my children. And my oldest is the one who's the reader. And I'm like, I don't know what to do here. So, you know, like I was wearing out my little honey for a child's heart. I was going mm -hmm. through the sunlight. And I'm like, I kind of reached a point where I had to train my son how to, you know, be smart about the books. Like if it has this content or if it feels like it's going right here, stop and come talk to me. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, there's only so much researching and, I mean, there's just so many things. So I know you guys, or you in particular, go through and you have a seven-point test. Is that mm -hmm. correct? That is correct. Can you share a little bit about how you do that? Because I think that's so valuable for parents to hear about how you're evaluating books. Mm, I'd be glad to. Uh, there's just some background information. When I build a curriculum, I try to build it with boy and girl books. So it's kind of a balance because uh -huh. we have both types. I try to choose not too many of the same author, mainly because um, I figure once you find an author, if you like his style or his or side style, you know, mm -hmm. you can find more of them. And that's it. I'm trying to do it as almost a resource kind of a thing. Sometimes I have to use more than one of a particular title because if you're looking for easy readers, boy, you want Clyde Bull. I mean, there's just certain authors that really, really work well. So I do use some more, but that's the goal. <laughs> but what I'm looking for are, uh, number one, I'm looking for real and realistic characters. You know, you don't want your, I don't want my heroes to be flawless because none of us are, right? Yeah. We want to look at, we want to look for something real, right? I don't want my anti-heroes to be terrible. You know, the people in black that you just don't want to even see. <laughs> yes. <laughs> we want them to be nuanced and complex the way people really are. So that's really important to me and that's what I'm looking for. And I, as I think about that, it's one of those where, let me look at my notes here. I had a book, oh, realistic one of the stories that I think really exemplifies it really well is a book called About Average. The story of a little girl who's in school and she gets average grades. She's not super good at anything. She plays violin. She's not the best. She plays sports. She works hard. And basically, she ends up becoming the hero in a really unexpected way. And all the things that she's learned and worked on and carefully uh, worked toward uh, come together. Mm -hmm. Quite a great story of somebody who's just kind of ordinary becomes a hero. It's a really, really great story. So that's the that's first neat. one. Comments on that one? <laughs> oh, no, I think that is so cool. Is that, you know, that's one of the things I think I love about, we were talking as a family about the Narnia series. Mm -hmm. And my kids are like, oh, okay, mom. Because like anytime we'll, because I feel like we're always, somebody's always going through the books here. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and, and then we'll usually watch the movies, you know. So mm -hmm. as we're starting to watch the second round, my, my middle is 10. So I've got five kids, 17 mm -hmm. down to five. So when my middle, who's 10, started watching them, I'm like, oh, I love the character developments. Mm -hmm. And oh, look, you know, Edmund is making bad choices. And mm -hmm. we try to get them to identify Good. What character quality are you seeing in him right now? Yeah. And then in the second book, you're like, what do you think he learned? And how do we, you know, so it's neat to see that because we are flawed. I mean, we see it in the Bible yeah. all the time. Yeah, totally David's a man after God's own heart. And yet, yeah. you know, totally <laughs> totally you have to true. keep reading. <laughs> Think about, I, so, okay, share more. No, 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 yes. that's, that's number one. And the second one yeah. is tied to that, which is solid character development. So mm. for me, it's really important that the protagonist grows and develops for the good over the course of the book. So when you get to high school, that's not quite as as, as true, but it is particularly true in the younger grades. We don't want to pretend mm -hmm. that the world is perfect, but we want it to be, we want to show that it's optimistic. You know, we mm -hmm. want to show it and overcome. That's the goal. That's a big one for me. That young people can step up and go through hard times and live with courage. Those are really, really important. 
and they can make a difference in their families and their communities. So that's 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 kind of what I'm looking for in character development. And I think an example of that would be the sign of the beaver, uh, where a young boy goes off to the wilderness and has to try to figure out how to live on his own and figure out how to live with the Native Americans that are there. And uh, there's just a, a growth and a development. And that's an example of how that would work. Yeah, that was a tough book. Mm -hmm. Beautiful book, though, isn't it? <laughs> So good, so yeah. good. But I was like, okay, I'm, like, I'm crying. <laughs> I told them that I remember, like, one of my boys was like, "Would you ever do that?" I'm like, I could never. I mean, it was different times, different times. Yeah, I found myself a little mad. I'm like, how could the dad let this kid? Just <laughs> crazy, but it's just different times. But so good. Different, different times. It's totally, totally yeah. cool. So the third one for me is I'm also looking for readers' cultural literacy. Mm. We can often teach kids to read, but if they don't have the framework to understand what they're reading, they don't always they don't always get it. And mm -hmm. uh, Hirsch talks about gives an example of that where he has kids who are in junior college, and he has one group of he has all of them read one article on love, and all the kids can decode the words, they can answer the questions because they know kind of what love is. And then he has a second article on uh, Lee meeting Grant at Appomattox Station. And unless you know that that's the final meeting of the Civil War, that article has no meaning for you. So the mm. kids who did not understand or know the history behind that, they couldn't answer the questions because they didn't. Authors ex assume that you know what the world is about and they don't give you every piece of information. So I'm looking for cultural literacy because that's important to me. <laughs> yeah. So it was, it's the, they have to help, help you understand how the world really works because you want kids to read broadly. You want them to see big picture. You want them to understand what's happening in the world because it's important for them, right? Absolutely. And an example. And I think that's one thing, I was, I was going to interject yeah. there, yeah. but um, yeah. I think that's one thing that really drew both my husband and I to the idea of homeschooling mm -hmm. was when we had, we had some different speakers come and speak at our church. And one of them was David Barton oh. and he works with American Heritage and he mm -hmm. was sharing these stories and letters from, you know, different presidents and different yeah. things. We're like, we never learned that. And never. as we studied American history for the first time as a homeschool yeah. family, I mean, yeah. I was the nerd who was, I shouldn't say it like that, but I was the one that was like <gasps> devouring books. And I was finding all these books and my kids are like, this is over our head, mom. We don't understand what you're reading. <laughs> I'm like reading all this. I'm like, this is so cool because you just, you don't understand. We had so many things that were cut out. Yeah of our, of what we're learning. And so getting to find books. And I think I found that the biography style books gave so much more depth because then you really understand the person and then you see how that affected history. Mm -hmm. And so cool. I, I so, yeah. totally agree. The example I wanted to give is yeah. when we do our, we study, we spend a year studying the Eastern hemisphere, which is a part of the world that most people don't study. But in part of that, we hit certain countries of the Eastern hemisphere, one of those being Russia. And when we study Russia, what the kids read or the parents read to them is a book called um, Breaking Stalin's Nose, which is set during the Stalin era. And it's a time of, you know, when the secret police would come through and uh, there just weren't very many things in the store. It was just a time of, it was such a dark time. And it, mm. what happened, and I agree with you, biographies are great, but I think historic fiction can totally make a time period come alive in a way that we probably don't grasp in another way where you actually sense the fact that this is a scary time to live in and you, you feel it in your actual gut. <laughs> anyway, mm -hmm. I, don't know where, uh, I think similarly, uh, we read um, Roll of Thunder, Hear My Cry. <laughs> and mm -hmm. uh, one of my son-in-laws, you know, said, oh, that whole deal about, you know, blacks and whites, that's not such a big deal, is it? And all of my kids, after reading that story, kind of rose up and kind of went, oh, yes, it was. <laughs> and it was because they had lived through this very dramatic, you know, prejudice and, you know, just the mm. way that Blacks were treated. And uh, it, it was one of those where it was riveted in their heart in a way that I just think you probably wouldn't get ever in a history book. Can I preach oh, it? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And it's important for us to know because you mm -hmm. see that, I mean, I, I'm in California. Okay. I grew up for the most part in California. We are a melting pot out here. Mm -hmm. So we don't feel the racial tension, like mm -hmm. as much as you feel in other areas. Right. And it's so, I, I, I dare not say it like that, but it's so backwards. <laughs> so places, <laughs> I'm like, what is wrong with you? I'm like pigmentation doesn't define a person. Oh, yeah. What? Mm -hmm. And so it's so weird. But when you read mm -hmm. books like that, I mean, mm -hmm. my kids, I remember it, I always, 
as I'm going to get emotional. You saying it's like, it breaks my heart when mm -hmm. we read through history mm -hmm. and you see how people are treated mm -hmm. and it's just, it makes me ache, but it's mm -hmm. so important for us to remember that history. Mm -hmm. And so we don't forget it. And like, you always hear those stories about people who try to say, oh yeah, like the Holocaust, that didn't happen. You're like, no, oh. you know, like, <laughs> how can you say that? I and so, I don't know. <laughs> I know. And so it's important for us to remember the horrible parts of history so that we don't go back to doing that. Yeah, yeah that's totally, totally. Oh, true. Okay, tell me more. Oh, number, yep, yep. <laughs> number four is uh, we want to have an intriguing multi dimensional plot. You know, the storyline mm -hmm. has to be something mm -hmm. that's compelling. But and I think the one that really brings that to home for me is um, When You Reach Me. Uh, it's mm -hmm. a um, more recent Newbury medalist that has this plot twists and all the things that you kind of go is when you go back and read it through, oh, that was there. Oh, that was there. But it's one of those where it just keeps you moving. Uh, so I would just recommend if you're not reading a book that you don't love, that you're slogging through, don't. Oh, there's lots of other ones. Find a good one. <laughs> That's a great point. That's a really great point. <laughs> oh, and I have to say that there was one thing that was so funny because um, we used sunlight uh, for when we were doing American history. Thank and you. it was so fun because like part of the way through I, I, I was giggling I was like oh look at these silver stickers on all the books <laughs> like, <laughs> Award. I'm like maybe maybe when I'm looking for books I can look off a list that says Newbery okay. Awards <laughs> <laughs> so yeah that's for sure <laughs> yeah it's a very good place to start <laughs> uh, number five it has to be emotionally compelling it has to move me uh, mm -hmm. and I think too when a book helps when a book moves you it helps kids remember the content. I mean, if you meet Tony Tremaine and you just fall in love with the people he's interacting with, you know, it just becomes, the Revolutionary War becomes much more compelling, much more uh, com in your heart and in your face. It's one of those where it just helps, uh, it builds empathy. It's one of those things where I just think, oh my goodness, can we um, make uh, things happen in a way that's not normal? <laughs> I think in a book that we could examine for that would be A Long Walk to Water. Huh? which is the story of an African immigrant who comes to the States and ends up uh, relatively well-to-do. And he goes back and he drills wells for a tribe that his tribe would, used to would fight for. It's a story of just reconciliation and uh, it's just beautifully done. But it's one of those where we see the world in a different way based on uh, the different books that we can read. It's amazing. Mm, so good. Okay, what's number six? Number six, it has to be verbally beautiful. <laughs> you know, there's some books that you just gotta go, starts and you go, nope, not gonna finish nope. that. Book. <laughs> Still not gonna do that. <laughs> right. <laughs> <I'm> snobby. <laughs> no, it's fun. I mean, because I mean, we're educating, That's and true. I mean, you're, our kids are building vocabulary. In fact, That's true. my son nailed me on something one time because he wrote something. I'm like, That's a weird choice. To put that word there, and he reads so much British, um, you know, classics and British literature, and I'm like, and I'm looking. He goes, "No, mom." He goes, "Like, look at the definition." I'm like, "Yeah, you're just gonna trust me in this one." I'm like, "It's just not something we would use." I'm like, "Okay, so if they use it in like old classics, like English based." I'm like, "That it doesn't make sense to me." But I, 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 I mean, I have to be dictionary sometimes. <laughs> one girl's gonna fall all over him, going, "Oh my goodness, you are so so smart." <laughs> And I think too, when we when we read beautifully written books, it helps our kids learn how to write better, right? So it's just actually yes. a really useful tool. And then the number seven is it has to be rereadable. Uh, we mm. want to, it's one of those where uh, years ago I had in the curriculum that um, <laughs> where the red fern grows, and I was working through it again the second time with my gen, my next gen group group of kids, and I went, oh, I actually can't read that, so it came came out the next year, and I'm going to get hate mail on that because some people do really love it, but. <laughs> An example of a book that I have read multiple times is, you mentioned it earlier, the Narnia series, Horse and His Boy. I probably read them 20 times and it's just one of those books that I just adore. It's one of those so beautifully written and every time you get done and you go, oh, did I enjoy that? And that's the ultimate goal, right? That you get done with the book and you say, oh. And honestly, when my daughter was in third grade, she looked at me, she said, oh, I never read a book I didn't love. And I thought, oh, we've arrived. We've done it, we've done it. <laughs> Oh my goodness. That is so perfect. So that's oh, seven points. 
And uh, do you need me to reread them, or will you remember them? <laughs> oh, if you want to, if you want to recap, you can yeah. you can recap. Do it <laughs> if it's you easy. Have, yeah, so. you want real realistic characters. You want mm -hmm. character development. You want content that adds to readers' cultural literacy. You want an intriguing, multi-dimensional plot. It has to be emotionally compelling. And how many times did the end of the story you kind of go, oh, I, I might be a little weepy here because it's just so beautiful. <laughs> it has to be verbally beautiful. It has to be re-readable. So that's what I'm looking for. I don't know if I always re achieve it, but that's the goal. So I love it. Now, we do have a few um, viewer questions that have oh. popped up. So I want to pull up at least one up. Hopefully, we have some time for one. So let me pull this up. This is from Mariah. And it says, when is your favorite time of day to fit in read alouds? Oh, when I, I, my children are grown at this point. But when we homeschooled, we would do our seat work first thing in the morning. We we're all pretty uh, morning people. So we start at eight, do all our math and spelling and all those kinds of things, get that all done. And then at 10, we whoever wasn't done, had to be done and they'd have to do their work later on in the afternoon. That was kind of the way to keep them motivated. And then we did all of our reading together. We take a snack and then we do, first we do a Bible because I found if we didn't do Bible first, we didn't get it done. So <laughs> right. one of those where, and I think it's the enemy. You know, it's one of those where you do it first, oh, yeah. you get it done, you know, it's a, and then we would do our history, then we do science, and then we do finish with our read aloud. And I did it in that order because I found that that was kind of the carrot at the end of it. Oh my goodness, you know, and then we'd read as long as they could stand. And a lot of times we'd finish a book way too early because it's just fun. It's fun to read and that's how we did it. So oh, I love it. That, that you did as well. When do you pick? Yeah, you know, we, we do. Um, sometimes it, it depends on the baby schedule. So <laughs> we've got older kids now, but we'll do it as just part of our day. Sometimes we're catching up on weekends, um, mm -hmm. but we, we, when we have the little people and they're pulling at books, I, read aloud was the one thing I moved to the end of the day. And God bless the people who have Audible and have their books on Audible because there are definitely seasons where I love the concept of reading aloud. I think there's something about hearing an adult read the cadence of a book mm -hmm. and they learn how a book should be read. And so when you, I mean, moms and dads, we can get into it or just read it straight. But um Sometimes I have to just throw a book on Audible and they're listening to it as they're doing math or as they're doing penmanship. And it works and even when we're reading all as a family. I mean, I, I, I tell a story a lot of times when I open, when I'm speaking at homeschool conventions about like my, my perfect picture when we started homeschooling, I would have my first grader and my kindergartner boys. Oh. And like sitting and reading a book together and our toddler boy would be sitting at our feet and um, it would just be this perfect little moment like a few minutes in like everybody just wants to like move around and go. <laughs> so, well, and they're all in books, so. Yeah and I never made my kids sit still you know they usually would play with some Legos on the floor and they want to be quiet you know they couldn't be disruptive. Mm -hmm. and, uh, to, to be fair to your picture my husband my children had the best best childhood my husband every evening would sit with all of them scrunched around him and he was the most dramatic reader you could ever hear. And all of them, they just adored it. So it's one of those where, and I knew oh. I had a good book when he would cry, you know, like he'd start, you know, oh. he'd stop reading and it's one of those like, oh, that's a good one. We'll put that one in. <laughs> like, Add it to the list. I know. What's cute is my husband um, has traveled for work for, um, you know, all of his corporate life really. And uh, one, one year, especially when we had first started homeschooling, he wanted to be more involved. And this is, don't laugh, this is before the days of like video <laughs> chat. Like we probably could have tried to figure out Skype, but it was when our two oldest were our only homeschoolers and we had little Wadey Woo who was kind of, you know, running around a little toddler. And so he actually traveled with um, some of the Narnia books and oh. he would read it to the kids. And so it was just so sweet because it's oh. like we can keep up in our, we got a little behind sometimes because yeah, yeah. the time changes, it was tough, but it was so neat that mm. we could continue that. And it was a neat thing to do just to keep oh. our family connected. So there's so many mm -hmm. amazing ways mm -hmm. for books to make a connection. And um, so I, I love it. Thank you for creating such an amazing resource for not only homeschool families, but other families too. And I hope everybody who are, who's watching on Facebook will check out the links below. Um, when this gets moved over to YouTube, I will have all these same links over there as well. And if you are listening in on the podcast, you're going to have to go to the show notes to check out all the links too. So we will have it wherever you are listening, watching, or viewing, or consuming 
this interview. But thank you so much for coming on. Thank you so um, much for having me. I appreciate what you do, encouraging moms in such an important role. So thank you. Thank you for doing that. Absolutely. Well, wonderful. Well, thank you viewers for coming on and watching the Simply Joyful podcast live here on Facebook. Again, do make sure that you go in, give me like five minutes and I will put some of the show notes on with all of the links in one location. So if you are looking to get either a free copy of my Sanity Savers for Moms book, um, you can do that again by going to christyclover.com slash join. Do make sure that you are following both myself and Sarita on Facebook. Uh, so I will have all of those links as well. But thank you for joining us here on the Simply Joyful podcast. I hope you have a blessed rest of your day. And don't forget to live simply and be joyful. Mm -hmm.